of reducing unintended pregnancies. And there's a lot of, you know, momentum to align around this with, we've had some conversations this week with Upstream, who's the national foundation that's doing um, trainings for one key question and some other sort of practice transformation work around, uh, around reproductive health excuse me, around reproductive health. Um, so again, there's a lot of good energy in our community for this. And I think that it speaks really strongly to prevention work, which we've all felt, you know, hasn't, um, hasn't been totally, we aren't totally hitting the mark on prevention work when it comes to all the demonstration projects. A lot of them are more intervention instead of upstream. So I think this is a good opportunity for us to sort of look at some of those intervention strategies um, and also support a lot of uh, community work. So up on the screen, you have some just some background information. Um, something that I think stood out to me was the statistic, and I got this from Planned Parenthood, that half of women with chemical dependencies experience four or more pregnancies. And you can see how I think that's going to align well with a lot of that we're, a lot of the work we're doing from a prevention angle for the opioid work and um, working within the behavioral health population. All right, any questions on the goal of reducing unintended pregnancies? Next slide. Oh. Hey, Hadley, I do have a question. This is Dave Crump. Sure. You say that's a goal, but we have chosen not to address that right now. So I'm just, if you can just kind of clarify that when you say it's a goal, but it's not our goal, correct? Correct, not yet. So this is, we're looking to see if, um, the BHT board is interested in adopting these four goals as sort of ACH region-wide goals um, that we could sort of, you know, use as a sort of a movement building effort to align some of these other um, initiatives that are happening that weren't really captured in our demonstration projects. Got it. Any other questions? All right, so moving on to behavioral health access. This should be pretty obvious. Um, I think this is a no-brainer given, you know, that a lot of the work that we're doing anyways is going to be a, about increasing access to behavioral health services. And, um, you know, there's, we're already sort of being tied to a level of this as we're being measured for penetration rates with, when it comes to mental health and substance abuse treatment. Um, and this really just speaks to the intense need that we have in our region for more behavioral health treatment services and beds. Um, this is obviously going to support and align well with our work for our pathways and in the jail transition efforts. Um, and I think just, you know, I, I don't feel like this is hard to justify. Our community is desperately needing more access. So this would be a good way to um, sort of help, help that rallying cry for the whole region. And next slide. And then the final, um, the final metric that we're looking at is a reduction in jail recidivism by 20%. Um, you know, this is, first of all, something that the Spokane County pilot is going to have to be tracking because um, it's a deliverable for their MacArthur grant. We, we're going to have to do some thinking about how is the best way to, mail, uh, to measure recidivism for, this, uh, for these efforts. But this is a great opportunity for us to really demonstrate how cross-sector linkages are going to be creating shared savings in our community, as we can see how supporting the health and social needs of someone exiting jail is actually saving money for the county when that person doesn't reoffend because they've stayed stable. Any questions there? Yeah, Hadley, this is Torney. Are we looking at this metric being across the entire BHT region, or is this primarily Spokane? So I think we would have to think about that, and I'd sort of propose that if we um, if we approve these measures, that we're going to have to send this one back and work with both the team that's developing the measurement process for the recidivism rates for the Spokane County pilot and figure out how they're doing that, and if there's a way we can figure it out regionally. I don't anticipate that all of our counties are going to be partic participating in a jail recidivism or a, j a jail transitions project, so this may just be something where we're looking at recidivism rates within the jails that are participating in some sort of project. Um, so I think we would need to talk, do a little more work to figure out exactly how this would be measured. But our hope would be that we, you know, just have some sort of way to capture that we've reduced recidivism rates to some extent. And I think, you know, I would imagine I'll be leaning on your data center folks for a little bit of help in that. <laughs> yes. Yeah, so well, I'm just curious too, then, 
if we have some that sort of don't want to participate, maybe they become a control group for a study. Oh, interesting. Yeah. That would make a lot of sense. Good idea. Okay, and then the, my final slide, see I told this, told you all this would be quick. It's just sort of the anticipated next steps. So, you know, we're going to be talking about this again um, at the board meeting next week. Uh, but, you know, I would anticipate that once or if we approve these measures, that sort of the next steps would be that the waiver finance work group would be responsible for developing any funding mechanism that might be tied to these. So we may set level some sort of incentive payment for um, work that, will help achieve these metrics. So I'm imagining that might look like um, we could have some metrics tied to the adoption of one key question or the adoption of, uh, or the applying of oral, oral um, fluoride varnish, excuse me, that you know are leading towards those goals and we'll have some sort of funding mechanism attached to them. So that would be the work of the waiver finance group to build that out. Um, and then I also feel like the technical councils would need, would have a role in sort of specifying the selection of these metrics to figure out um, exactly how we would measure them and what process we would need in order in order to figure all of that out. So really our hope is that we can we can really look at these metrics and vote on them next week so that we can use them as sort of a as a way of really talking about what is transformation in a bigger picture than just some of the metrics that we're being tied to that are so process level or so focused on very specific um, clinical elements that maybe don't speak to sort of the heart of what this work is, like what is big systems transformation, and we're hoping we can socialize these four goals a little more so that it kind of captures that bigger, um, the bigger heart of this work. So with that, um, last slide, slide Jesse, um, that's really the quick overview. This is what we're hoping to be talking about next month, and I'm here, I mean next week, and I would really um, appreciate any feedback sort of on what would you all need to know in order to make a decision on uh, voting on whether or not we would use these metrics. Well, this is Tony. Back to my very first question earlier, do we anticipate by next week we'll have some guidance on opiate? Um, I will look, we, I have not heard when they expect they're gonna release updated data for the opioid stuff. Everything that I've gotten, it's just been blank. And says TBD. So I can I can ping on that and see if I get anything back, um, but I'm not hopeful that we'll have it by the board meeting. Okay, I know that in the uh, piece that was sent out where we got the uh, announcement of the fact that we met the qualifications for this first phase, um, under the opiate piece, it does break out opiates into prevention, treatment, overdose, and recovery pieces. Uh -huh. And are we are we planning to use the six building blocks piece as a pr proponent of that prevention for our clinical um, folks? I think ultimately whether or not we're going to use that is going to be a recommendation from the Provider Champions Council. I know that Sharice and Jenny have been doing a lot of work. They've been talking with the six building blocks people to try to figure out, to get a little more information about it. Um, and we'll be connecting with the Provider Champions Council on that for a recommendation on whether or not that's a good fit for our region. As, okay. with, all, as with the other elements in the opioid project. Okay, because I know Department of Health has held back from having that be an effort that we utilized because they wanted to make sure they didn't conflict with the ACH. Oh, oh I see. Okay. I will. I can let Cherise and Jenny give them a heads up about that. Great, thanks. Hey, this is Aaron. I was my question relates to funding for these additional initiatives. Um, and so, what do you guys have ideas where that additional funding would come from? Um, I so my understanding based on Allison is that this would this would be something that we would allocate with project dollars, like later in later years. So we'd be using project dollars for projects that we didn't identify. I, I just want to be clear on that because that piece seems to me a little bit challenging as I think just how to organize the work. Yeah, that uh, I totally understand that. Let, I can go back to Allison at least before the board meeting to make sure that I have some more clarity on what her what she is thinking on where those funds would draw from. 
And I think it's just more of a logic of why would we use dollars that we've identified to support these specific projects that have been identified to actually support other initiatives that aren't, we're not necessarily being reported against or held yeah, accountable. I think that our hope is that the work that sort of falls under these four measures, these four goals, aligns very well and supports all of the work within the, the transformation projects. So we don't want to see them as an opportunity to fund something like totally different that doesn't actually support the metric or the goals that we're being paid for. Um, so I think whatever, whatever recommendations were developed for this, they would have to support the overall transformation metrics as well. Hey, this is Kai. I seem to recall back when we made the final decision to support the four project model versus the six or eight, that we would somehow incorporate some of the BHT work into supporting the remaining four that were not selected. So do these four suggestions you have here, do those kind of address those four or are those being addressed somehow else? And kind of in line with what Aaron is saying is if those aren't, are there, you know, plans or dollars or something like that that you might have in the back of your mind as to where that might happen? So I think, yeah, I think this is where that would happen, uh, definitely. So this is a, definitely a call out to the oral health and maternal and child health projects that we did not select. And Kai, you're right. When we, um, when we made the decision to approve those four projects, I think the actual motion included some language about finding ways to support elements, key elements of the other four projects that we did not select. Um, the other two would be diversion and transitions. And we have found lots of ways where we're going to pretty much need to include elements of diversion and transition projects in strategies of this work just to support it overall. Um, and I think that's going to be true definitely for increasing behavioral health access and when it comes to reducing recidivism because there were elements um, in the transition and diversion projects that would lead well to the jail transition work. Um, so I do think that these these four metrics are a way for us to have a mechanism to give some dollars to some of those other strategies that there was a lot of interest and in, desire to move on, but that we didn't ultimately select as a transformation project. Is that kind of the primary driver behind these four metrics that you're proposing, or is there something else that's pushing this along? That's definitely, I mean, that's the primary driver along with just sort of, I think it's helpful to have um, I think we've been feeling as BHT staff that it's hard to sell some of the community on just the sort of very granular metrics that are earning us dollars and that if we have some sort of more overarching sort of transformation, like very transformative goals, um, it could bring a little more heart and energy to this work to help us as we are communicating from, you know, how are the, like, individual practice transformation at a setting level translating up into a full-scale community change. Okay. I think it's very noble work, but I would echo the, the sentiment that Aaron did in terms of where would those dollars come from, and I think that's something, you know, I think that's something I need a little bit more information on uh, next week in order to better understand whether we can support this or not. Of course, we may not have all the answers, but it'd be helpful to know some of the thinking behind it. Great, that's really helpful. Thanks, Kai and Aaron. And I just one quick follow up to that. I don't, you know, I was on the earlier phone call where Allison sort of went through the IGT funding mechanism, and you know, knowing that there's those dollars that are going to reside in domain one, I don't know if there's any opportunity where we could identify those dollars to support some of these initiatives, or whether there even would be any overlap. But that would allow us to keep our BHT controlled dollars. Um, allocated to the four projects that we're going to be held accountable and potentially leverage some of those other dollars that we don't have direct control over to further some of these ventures. Yeah, that's a that's a great idea. I don't have enough clarity right now to know how much of an overlap there is, but that's something I can be looking out for and try to get some answers for the board meeting. Any other thoughts or comments? Again, this is really just sort of some background information, some prep info, and it's helping me know what I, um, what else I can present to help us make a decision next week. 
Okay, thanks for giving us a heads up. No problem. If there is uh, no other comments, I'm happy to let us all go and have the last hour of our day back. Um, we did record this webinar and we'll be sending it back to um, the rest of the board members who were not able to attend so that they can get a little prep too if they're interested. Um, and otherwise, we will follow up on this at the board meeting next week. All right, Sounds thank awesome. you. Thank you. Thanks for your input.